Welcome to Behind the Screens with Flavored Enemy. I'm DM over with Flavored Enemy, uh, and with me today, I have the GM Alex from Inspired Incompetence. Tell us a little about yourself, Alex. Thank you. Yes, hello. Uh, I am Alex. I'm the GM over at uh, the Inspired Incompetence podcast, as you just said, uh, where we are playing through the Tyrant's Grasp adventure path uh, from Paizo for Pathfinder First Edition. Uh, it's a survival horror themed campaign uh, all about dungeons and undead and all things spooky such as that. Okay. So, <laughs> there's a lot of uh, a lot of interesting things that you can be doing with that. A lot of interesting ways it can go. Um, <clears throat> yeah, and uh, for those of you who don't know, I'm DM over at Flavored Enemy. I handle uh, a lot of projects under the Flavored Enemy umbrella, so Scourge of Stars, Tales of Vittore, and then Behind the Screens as well. Um, and so, I mean, between the between the two of us, I'm pretty sure we have at least at least a decade of uh, DMing experience. I mean, I've got nine years myself. How about you? Oh, uh, it's been a while since I, uh, I tracked myself on that, but I think I might be about nine years as well, so almost two decades yeah. there between the two of us. <laughs> yeah. Um, so we're talking today about compelling BBEGs or big bad evil guys or gals or anything of non uh, binary conforming. So as far as you go, when it comes to like the initial stage, like the writing of a compelling big bad evil guy what's the first thing that goes through your mind when you're writing for that villain hmm uh so for me uh more important than what the big bad evil guy is is what he's not um so one thing he's not is he's not more important than the PCs in the story. And that's, I think even for extremely experienced GMs, that is an important rule to always keep in mind. And we all have our, our stories with their ups and downs and pitfalls and victories. And a lot of it might rely on the big bad evil guy getting his way at certain points. But, I think uh, it is very important that if something unexpected happens, and let's face it, very often that does happen, uh, and the players uh, best you in a way you did not expect, uh, the big bad evil guy, he's going down. Uh, and if you deny them that, then they're not going to care about him anymore, and they don't care about the story anymore. So that's... Like that is like rule number one for any any new big bad evil guy I create. No matter how much I fall in love with him, uh, his mechanics, his story, uh, his personality, uh, that is my top priority. Yeah, that, that's 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 a big pitfall too. Is is that a lot of uh, a lot of uh, the newer, more more inexperienced, and even sometimes the experienced uh, DMs and GMs, like you said, they they get attached to these villains that you know same way that a player would get attached to their character but as a dm you just, you got <laughs> if you love them you got to let them go right <laughs> exactly yes um yeah so like with the writing stage like like what you say like absolutely preach um and f from from my point of view one of the one of the things that i also put a lot of prevalence into is from my experience as as a DM, uh, the for middling villains, you know, villains that are you know maybe once or twice they reoccur, or you know lower level, it's fine to have that chaotic evil wants to watch the world burn type villain. But when it comes to those big bad evil guys, those overarching campaign long villains, I've found that it's imperative that there at least be some sort of 
some sort of, of sympathy, some sort of like this could have been a, a, a good person. This could have went out, went down differently. And there are still some redeeming qualities about this villain, but that does not mean that they should not be taken down. Sure. Uh, I definitely like a good sympathetic villain. Um, I, I don't think that that is a, a prerequisite to being like a, a great villain. And I think that, uh, a lot of times, especially with, um, like a lot of modern media, uh, sympathetic villains have become a lot more popular. And I think that's a really cool thing. Uh, but I think that m for, for me, it, it's very close to what you're saying, but for me, I think, uh, not necessarily sympathetic, but I think the villain, the villain's motives should, uh, be understood. Like, so I, I suppose instead of sympathy, it would be an empathy, uh, to, to be more general about it is yeah. you, you might not want to side with this villain, but you can at least understand why he's a villain. Yeah. And I think I that's, agree. yeah, I, I think that's so I'm kind of, kind of in the same vein as, as what you're saying. Um, you don't necessarily need to feel bad for him, but it, like, like you said, just the, the, the wanton destruction, I'm evil because I want to be like, that's, that's, that's just, uh, usually a very hollow villain and they can still be fun to tangle with sometimes, but the, to be a really compelling villain is having that sense of empathy. Yeah, I agree. Um, I agree is that it's, that's the, those motives, the understanding of the villain and everything like that, that is hallmark to making a villain that it, it, it makes it makes the conquest against the villain that much more dire exactly and it, it gives it gives a lot it gives real context for when the heroes uh, have their eventual uh, faded climactic battle with the with the villain uh, having that much needed context on why they're fighting him and what it means if he if he wins or loses uh, is having that having that context of why why this person is a villain, what he actually wants and why he wants it. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I mean hmm. Yeah, I, I agree. I mean I mean look at look look at the the, the hallmark media villains, right? Even, even, even like chaos villains like the Joker, in, in from DC Comics, uh, he's he's now uh, at a point in, in in the media where even his motives are under are understood to a degree. Obviously, you know it's he's still a an insanity level villain, but some of some of his stuff starts to become uh, noticeable. You look at like. Loki from Marvel and how he has that sympathetic villain vibe like we talked about that's becoming more popular. Uh, Anti-heroes are becoming heroes and such. So making compelling BBG is in a way becoming more difficult because more and more people are still saying that, oh yeah, they're they're making bad choices, but that doesn't make them a villain. <laughs> You know, like you could, I could have like, uh, you know, someone who's going around and um, exterminating monster races before they grow up, and we'll have some in, some instance of players and characters will be like, okay, well, this is still a good thing, you know, this could right. kind of like excusing the darker nature of certain characters as it's become like more common for that to be something that's redeemable yeah absolutely uh and it, it it might make a lot of sense you know that you know this this person's going around killing uh entire families of uh giants and uh goblins orcs because these are monsters that are classic fantasy bad guys yeah. And so, you know, like, okay, well, yeah, everybody knows that those monsters, they grow up to be, uh, well, monsters. 
Uh, so this, this guy makes a lot of sense. But if that same person were then to say, uh, oh, well, no, 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 uh, that includes half works too. Uh, then suddenly this, uh, this person who, uh, in, if you were to remove his dimensions and this guy is just going around, uh, killing people to kill people, then he must be stopped obviously. But, yeah. uh, what, but up, leading up to that point, it's really just, you know, this, uh, it's really just this, uh, blank slate of hit points and, uh, and death that the the players are chasing and then they stop him and then that's the it that's the end uh but throwing throwing in like a, an actual uh moral dilemma of well this guy is being helpful because he is drastically reducing the the threat out there of roving monsters uh, uh -huh. Traveling merchants are arriving at their destinations more regularly. Things are genuinely safer, and we can see why. But he's also adding this uh, other element of there's a civilized race of people who themselves are often pretty ostracized. But as the heroes, we can probably assume that the players might recognize that uh, that's a bad thing. And there's even the um, even you know minus the if we were to remove the half work part. There is still the the moral dilemma of well these monsters grow up to be monsters but that's still not okay. Yeah. Uh, so I think the more questions that a villain makes you ask, whether you're an active player in the campaign or not, uh, the the more the more successful he is because it, even if at the end of the day this guy's still evil, we have to kill him. Uh, if he if he's made uh, any sort of ethical impact or just made everybody stop and think for a minute and there was even a a moment where you had to consider should we let this guy go or at the very least should we like talk to him first I think that's uh, that's victory like you you've made a, a compelling BBEG. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. I mean, like, and, and there's nothing more satisfying than when the the party is sitting there uh, frustrated with what what to do next because you know they they could find themselves on one side, understanding and sympathizing with the initial problem that a villain was facing, and then on the other hand, they're sitting there like, okay, well, you took this problem that I understand and sympathize with, and then you did the wrong thing. That's true. Um, <laughs> uh, so, one of the things that that I've always, and, and I, I, even as an experienced DM, is whenever you're having to um, role play a, a a villain, a big bad evil guy, uh, one who is who is more serious, methodical, sinister, right? And you have a party. <laughs> you have a party who uh, is is gonna sit there and you know. Scary Movie 5, the villain, if you will. You know, just uh, absolute chaos, shenanigans, and jokes, <laughs> and having to uh, having to maintain that serious de the serious uh, demeanor. How do you go about doing that? Or what do you do in response to it? Uh, yeah, th this that was a problem I had quite a lot uh, in my, uh, my earlier years as a, a GM, and it always bothered me a lot. Uh, I was, I was certainly, uh, of my friends, I was the one who had the, the flair for the dramatic and I really liked a, consp a compelling story and I had a lot of fun crafting these, these plots and these bad guys pulling the strings and, uh, when things started to build up and I was so proud of, look at all these pieces falling together, aren't you impressed? And my friends, you know, be, being, uh, being, uh, you know, just teenagers who like to mash buttons and kill bad guys on their video games are like, okay, uh, I fire an arrow at this guy mid speech, um, and just kind of take all the wind out of my sails. Uh, yeah, it was very frustrating. Um, but I've come to, 
I've come to accept that that's just the way some people like to play the game. And it's not wrong. And it's just kind of up to you as the GM to manage your own expectations. Um, if you have a table of players who seem like they're genuinely into the story, then that's great. And you can play up the bad guy and be extra theatrical with them and have a lot of fun. And your players like that and they play into it. And it's great. And if you don't have a table that does that, I mean, there's always room to try to foster a, uh, a sense of appreciation for a villain like that or a kind of game like that. And maybe over time, uh, your table will come to appreciate that like you, even if only a little bit, you know, enough to, uh, to play along. And if that happens, then that's great. But it might still not happen. Uh, and if it doesn't, then it's really down it really comes down to um you know how badly do you want to run that kind of game and if it's really important to you then then that's a whole other discussion a whole other topic about uh like player gm synergy that uh we probably don't have time to get into uh but yeah. the i think the the simpler answer is to embrace the chaos um, yeah. Have create villains who are just as uh, off the off the rails as a group of chaotic murder hobos is. Uh, have fun with it. Uh, learn learn to love it, and you might find that instead of you fostering this love of the theatrical and these slow burning stories that your players might foster in you. Uh, a love of this more like slapstick kind of uh, game. Both are a yeah. lot of fun. It's just a matter yeah. of preference and you giving yourself permission to uh, enjoy that as well. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, like, so to kind of give a good example, a good sample of like how, how, how I handled that, you know, slapstick. Um, in my first uh, campaign that I turned to podcast, uh, The King's Call. We talked about there was a, and this is no spoilers really, uh, there was an encounter with what's called a Nilbog. And a Nilbog, for those of you who don't know, is a goblin spellcaster who has a sort of chaotic uh, type of magic and uh, that whimsy and fey like um, response to things. And because I knew this party was pretty slapstick off the bat, um, I brought in this kind of like villain of the week kind of deal. And the Nilabog, what he did, what he did is he didn't attack the party. He didn't he didn't uh, he didn't defend his people. No, his, his spells simply changed the parameters of the combat for everybody involved. Uh, he cast a spell that turned all weapons into bananas in the middle of combat. Um, he cast an, he cast another spell that um, enlarged everybody's noses during the combat. And just these little things like where there's this serious life or death combat thing going on. And there's Nilbog's over here just making all kinds of changes to the and to everybody, not just not just the party. Um, and it kind of embraced that whole slapstick nature and then bringing it over to like the the dark and brooding and sinister type villains. Um, I have a uh, I have, I have a, a love for the the masterminds type of villains i really do um so when it comes times for things like that i instead of trying to have like these big like monologue speeches at the party because i know i know how that's gonna end it's usually gonna end with a uh, an arrow or a gunshot straight to the middle of the eyes i am looking at you quincy wherever you are um <laughs> um no i like to i like to put little little tiny droplets of this is their real this is the real plot line this is what their plan is and such and then provide like a nice little tavern setting in between adventures where they actually have a moment to ruminate and reflect on all the bits of information that they've gathered and then watch the party start to put together this plan instead of the villain actually giving it wholly that's that's good that's uh that's good uh economy of storytelling uh, mm -hmm. instead of because mon monologues are 
uh, they're fine for Saturday morning cartoons. Mm -hmm. uh, they're not so great in uh, modern TV shows or movies, and they are just poison for tabletop role playing games. Uh, I've I've found that if if your if your BBEGs like big uh, like declaration or what have you when he's uh, encountering the the heroes for the first for the first time or like for the last time or whatever and you have more than two lines worth of dialogue for him uh, he's talking too much uh, yeah so you either need to give the party some of that information beforehand like you said uh, or you've gotta you've got to find some other way to break it up uh, in that encounter so he's not just spewing this uh, this speech at the players because they're not going to listen to most of it. Yeah. yeah I mean, I, I agree. Um, now, so the next bit is when when we're talking about those villain combat encounters, right? The big bad evil guy combat encounters where it's time for the final showdown, if you will, or the semi-final showdown if you're of that of that uh, flavor, how do you warrant the decisions when it comes to actions, spell casting, any kinds of stuff like that? Uh, how do how do you warrant the decisions that are made for those kinds of encounters? Like, how do I decide what uh, like what tactics they use, like round after round? Exactly, or like who they might focus on, or uh, you know the how they might go about things like how, how do you plan out your your villains um combat and actions yeah it's hard because especially if you've got your heroes just fighting this one guy uh it's usually like that's you know that's uh that's uh action economy that's a whole nother thing uh but having a single villain fighting all the heroes is usually going to wind up bad for for you know you and him uh so i typically try to have either environmental uh factors or hazards or have other minions or both to kind of slow down the heroes and find other ways for them to use up their resources and that takes a little bit of strain off of this singular uh, enemy uh, or not so singular optimistically um, yeah. but usually I will have like w once I've got those bases covered usually I will have uh, some sort of uh, like list of priorities uh, sometimes like depending on how much preparation the villain had maybe he's already uh, cast some spells drank some potions and got himself prepared uh, for the, the heroes arrived if uh, if they caught him unawares or they just like kicked the door down caught him in the middle of his evening tea then yeah. he might have to spend the first couple rounds either setting up uh, battlefield control or buffing himself uh, so I'll have sort of a list of priorities based on that and mm. then that just kind of becomes a loose guideline like during the actual fight because I've made this list beforehand uh, but then I'm, I'm not married to that list obviously if something if something big happens something that changes the status quo of the of the battle then he might need to you know switch up his uh, his tactics on the fly but I'm certainly not uh, afraid of having him make a tactical retreat if possible though like like i said at the beginning of our conversation uh i would certainly uh try to make it a fair and uh reasonable retreat i like, he doesn't suddenly sprout this plot armor if i feel like like oh well you know two of the heroes they they got like these big crits right early on that's not fair that's not fun so he's got you know, so you know i'm just gonna pretend he's got twice as much hit points and he's gonna run away um, so if he if he falls if something bad happens early on then that's just that's the roll of the dice yeah yeah no I agree 
I agree. I mean, like for for me, like when it comes time to that 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 point in combat, one of the first things that I that I think about when it comes to the villain is, you know, specifically with that high intelligence type big bad evil guy, like the uh, the monologuer or like the the mastermind. Um, I feel like the big thing that they could focus on in the beginning is that demerit that 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 like like you want to like hit them where it hurts you want to you want to um get them scared get them worried about everything so one of the first things that if you have the mastermind or, or type villain he'll either target a party leader or a party healer because you know high intelligence they're going to understand that those two are going to be the biggest benefit for a long battle and getting those off the field early will shorten it up. Um, and then, you know, for it comes time for the lower intelligence villain, he's going to go right for the barbarian. You know, big guy with the big muscles. Let's get him out of there. Yep. Yep. Um, <laughs> so um, heading into the first question that we have uh, from one of my players, M. How do you create intimidation with a villain? Like, do you do it in role play, in the backstory, the plot? How do you, how do you do that? Um, that's a really tough, uh, a really tough thing to pull off, in my opinion. Um, I mean, it's one thing to have somebody have like a high intimidate check and you roll it and you say I got a 54 you're intimidated and they go oh yeah you're right I am intimidated um but it, I I imagine uh the question is referring to like the players themselves feeling intimidated or uh like narratively you can tell this guy is intimidating um that's that's a it's a tough a tough order to sell uh, especially because you know a lot of times uh, players have that kind of disconnect with with their players, and it's it's very easy to make light of uh, of a lot of more tense situations. It's kind of it's a lot of people's natural reactions to if anything gets too dark or too uh, too grim. Uh, so to have that lasting impression of wow, that guy like really like gave me chills. Uh, it, it's tough, and a lot of it de it, it depends on. Uh, like kind of player buy-in of you know accepting like this guy's intimidating. I'm not gonna fight that. I'm gonna roll with that. Um, it's 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 dawning on me now that I'm <laughs> that a lot a lot of my uh, a lot of my comments on uh, players not taking the game seriously. Uh, this is from uh, years of, of of experience. That my my current group, if any of them happen to listen to this, I'm not referring to you guys. You guys are the best. Uh, and you t you take the game uh, just as seriously as I'd like you to. Um, I just thought I'd uh, need that disclosure. Uh, but anyway, um, so for making a a villain uh, intimidating or uh, racking up that intimidation, um, yeah, it's it's tough to do, and I think the. I think one really effective way to do it is with uh, enough sort of build up and uh, like intrigue and not necessarily from the villain himself. I think a good way to uh, get somebody effectively intimidated about a guy that they might come to fight in the future is to show the uh, the la the lasting impression he's left on other characters and uh, just other like maybe uh, he had a, a big epic battle somewhere and you can still see the like the damages that he left like if this is like a a powerful ancient wizard you can see the the magical scars that he left in uh in the landscape uh that, that is just yes that's like just have that be part of the backdrop and just let it speak for itself i think that mm -hmm. the more you try to put your villain front row center and have him tell you look how intimidating i am i think that's 
uh, a steeper and steeper hill to climb. I yeah. think that instead, uh, you know, on the quest to eventually meet this guy, whether they know it at the time or not, the more they hear about him from other people and see evidence of how intimidating he is for themselves, and they come to that conclusion themselves, I think that is the the most uh, effective way to to sell that intimidation factor. I mean, especially that, that intimidation thing. Like, if you if you look at like you know at like cinema and books and stuff like that, the most com- most the most intimidating villains because there's there's charismatic villains, there's other kinds of villains, but intimidation. Those villains, coincidentally, not. They have very few lines of dialogue. Their intimidation come from comes from their actions and the things that their presence implies. You know, you look at like Darth Vader, one of the most intimidating villains in cinematic history, has very little, very little di- lines of dialogue. But the lines of dialogue that he does deliver are, for one, really significant, important lines of dialogue, and for two. He backs up everything he says. You know, he 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 never he's never out here boasting or bragging. He's doing exactly what he follows through through, and that is, in my from my point of view, the essence of that intimidation in a villain is that they don't they don't need to scare you with their words. They're going to scare you with their actions, and just seeing the imagery of those actions and the aftermath of those actions will be intimidating enough. Yeah. Uh, that is very true. Uh, he's, he's not really a, uh, this person's not really so much a villain, I guess, but he's more of like a stand in for like a, a monster in a, in a horror movie. But, um, I'm also, I would also think of, uh, Jason from the Halloween movies. Yep. Um, because, and they've kind of tweaked the continuity as the movies have gone, but for the most part, um, what makes him so scary is the fact that you have no idea what he actually wants. Um, he's just this force of nature that is just doing what it does, and it can't be reasoned with. And uh, like once you're in his crosshairs, so to speak, uh, like that's it, you're done. And there, there's nothing to really be done about it. And he doesn't say a goddamn word in, the, in any of the movies. Um, and it's really just him, uh, like I said, doing what he does. And it's just the fact that there's just no telling why he's doing this. He's just doing it. And that makes him very scary. Yeah. Yeah, no, I agree. Like this, this, this slasher villains, they're all great, great, uh, case studies for how to make that intimidation when it comes to a villain. Yeah, and I do. It's not lost on me that that is completely counter to a point I made earlier, where the more compelling villains, uh, you have an empathy for them and you know why yeah. they're doing what they do. But yeah. we're talking about intimidation in this case, and that, yeah. that's a yeah. kind of a whole other can of worms. And it's also, you know, that 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 case of the the, the writers and the people that are, are are in the in the book in the movie sense of things, the directors, screenplay people. I'm fairly positive that they know exactly why Jason does the things that he does. It's lost on the audience. Why? And the, and the people in the story, why they're doing the things they're doing. There is a method to the madness. There is a plan. There is a formula. But the way that it's presented to the people in it, it seems like, they, like it's just a force of nature. Exactly. So... On to the next question from uh, my players, Drian. When should the big bad evil guy be introduced in a campaign? At what point in time? Oh, that is... I don't think there's a single right answer for that. I agree. Um, uh, I've introduced... And I, I guess a lot of this depends on how you would exactly define the big bad evil guy like is it the one true baddie of the entire campaign or could it just be you know this arc of the story's main antagonist which i think it i think that falls under the same umbrella um but that being said uh, i've introduced the the big bad villain uh 
very early in the story. Um, and it was a, a, a kind of a taunting, uh, like absolutely no uh, question uh, sort of introduction. Like this person wants you dead and they're going to hunt you down and you need to be ready for it. Um, it was done in a way where like the villain and the players and the characters weren't directly interacting. Um, yeah. But yeah, just like even from very early on, I think that was a very effective uh, introduction because it gave that villain so much more time to build up just the anticipation of eventually meeting them and fighting them. Um, and uh, then at other times, uh, I've introduced the big bad villain uh, like literally during the climax uh, of the adventure. Yeah, uh, they were, you know, they were always there. They're always pulling the strings, and they, the the players, learned about this villain, like by name, uh, a little earlier on, and just kind of knew that he was there. But very, very little was actually uh, revealed about them, uh, and. <laughs> This turned in. This actually turned out to be a kind of a monologue villain uh, himself, and so I, 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 I suppose I've, you know, I've contradicted some some of my own points a few times during this conversation. But I guess that just kind of goes to show how fluid, um, yeah. the uh, the running and designing a villain can be. Like there's there's a lot of different ways to uh, to go about it, and yeah. ways that. Th- general rules that you might tell people who are asking for advice uh that might apply most of the time can still work sometimes if uh you know if you if you nudge something in the right way but in 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 that case like meeting this villain for the first time and uh you know he he just turns and he invites the the heroes to you know sit down like let's have a conversation i find you so interesting uh you know that that encounter worked out very nicely because uh my my table was to an extent accommodating to that request because they happened to have a lot of questions about him because there was almost no information given uh, up until that point um so yeah and then anything in between could still work uh it's really a matter of what kind of story you're telling um and what kind of villain it is and what kind of expectations you as the gm kind of want to put on this villain uh so really any there's there's a whole spectrum anything anything can work um and it has yeah i mean and there's always the tried and true method of you know one of my favorites is you know introducing the quote-unquote big bad evil guy and upon his his defeat or his his the victory of the party over him or her and whatnot the reveal that this is just a lieutenant of the actual yes. big bad evil guy classic tried and true method always always a good one you know you look at lord of the rings with the ring wraiths and sauron you look at you look at um star wars with darth vader and palpatine you know it's it's been done many times and there's a reason it's been done it's because it, it works so well absolutely it's it's a because it doubles like not only is it an exciting reveal but it also doubles as a sort of uh like power scaling uh in a way where you know especially if the fight against this now revealed to be lieutenant was a tough one uh it gives uh, a scope to the uh the players like oh like this guy was just answering to this other guy this other guy must be insanely strong because we had a real tough time against uh his lieutenant so that's uh, that's that economy of storytelling again. Uh, yeah. you're, you're, you're turning this uh, this twist into valuable information for the players. Yeah, no, I agree. So our next question uh, from Inoki, uh, how deeply do you go when planting hints and clues and references to the big bad evil guy? So like when it comes time to like laying down those those plot that plot those those hints and tips and reveals and clues and insight into the big bad evil guy's motivations and plans and machinations 
how deeply do you go when you're when you're planting those? Um. Hmm. Uh, there's. I'm. I guess I think I'm having. I'm not totally sure what is meant by how deeply. Like how. Like how hard do I make it to find that information, or, um, like how much information do I reveal when, when I do? So I I believe it's like like you know when it comes time to like laying those things down like, like how in depth ingrained into the actual plot line how how behind this how how much do they have to dig how behind the scenes and how how deep into the actual. Um, storyline and and, and 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 secrets and such do you plant these things so like for example kind of give you a good one off the top of my, off the top of mine uh, oh yeah sure in one of my one of my uh, initial campaigns that I ran there was this puzzle that was um, the party had to solve that was and I know every DM and every player's worst nightmare a puzzle <laughs> um, there was this puzzle that they had to solve to be able to get to this location that housed the um, the uh, workshop of this um, alchemist who was the villain, right? Uh, um, and they were trying to get into this workshop to gather his notes to figure out what he did because they still had no clue about what he did. So, you know, they're going through solving the puzzle. It was a simple uh, rotation-based puzzle where they had to, you know, get a certain pattern right. Uh, based off of imagery and iconography of uh, symbols. And they eventually figured it out and solved it, got the information, and left with all the all the clues that they had. But what they hadn't figured out is that the combination to the puzzle was a cipher that was used to be able to actually understand what his notes said. Oh, wow. Um, so, <laughs> so, like, stuff uh, like that, that's... I think, is what they're meaning. I see. Okay, uh, that's that's a that that's a very uh, clever uh, way to get information. I uh, I tip my hat to that. Um, I I will admit I'm usually a little more light-handed uh, when it comes to giving out uh, information about the the villain. Mm -hmm. I've found that unless the players have specifically requested to have a a more uh, sleuthy uh, subtle kind of campaign uh, for the most part uh, players are uh, they're you know they, they sure they can be enjoying the story uh, as, as much as you want them to but a lot of uh, more subtle uh, or sneaky uh inserts that you might have might go completely unnoticed and when they do some, sometimes you might have a good note taker and they might have like an aha moment uh, several sessions down the line and that can be very rewarding but in my experience uh, if it doesn't get uh, if it doesn't get uh, spotted right there and then for the most part it's just going to get lost to obscurity unless you yourself try to, you know, bring it back. And that's always an option. But, uh, so I personally try to just be a little bit more, uh, direct when giving information about, uh, the villain. Um, so in, uh, our current campaign, uh, the, the, the bad guy, uh, not just the adventure, but the, the campaign is this very, very powerful lich. Um, and he's, he's shrouded in all kinds of mystery. Uh, nobody, uh, most, most of all the, the players, uh, knows very much about him. Uh, but there was one part of the story where they were, they were trapped in this magical barrier. And inside that barrier was a very extensive library. And they knew that the answer to getting out of the barrier was hidden in the library somewhere. So they started reading. Um, and this library happened to be, uh, owned by, uh, some holy knights of a lost, uh, lost order, uh, so to speak. Uh, so this order of knights happened to have a lot of information about that sort of thing. So once they were all done with their goal, finding 
the information on how to get past this barrier, I gave them one more skill check to continue researching the library, and they uh, they got enough a high enough roll. So, for anybody who doesn't know how uh, like monster ID monster IDing works in Pathfinder, basically like oh it's a a, a bone devil. Like, what do we know about bone devils? Well, roll a knowledge planes check, and if you get high enough, then you can ask questions about the bone devil like what does it have any special defenses does it have uh spell resistance what are give me a special attack and based on how high you pass your check you will get more or less information more or less questions that you're allowed to ask uh so i was you know i i I wasn't subtle about it uh it was still it was still rooted in their research but once they got high enough i just said you guys can ask one question about this lich that you've heard about um and so they so they did and they got a little bit of information about the lich and so that was it's a more mechanical sort of knowledge than uh like like a narrative uh bit of information uh but it also kind of like I, I, I keep saying economy of storytelling but I mean that's it's it's come up quite a lot it also kind of hinted at that point that this lich was going to be uh, an enemy and not just this big set piece that the campaign itself is set around Uh, because once I told them that you get information about this lich that kind of uh, that kind of uh, got them thinking like oh if Alex is giving us information about this lich that information must be important because we had to make a skill check to get it are we going to yeah. be fighting this lich that is like the baddest lich that ever was? Uh, <laughs> so, yeah. So I tend to be a little bit more uh, lighter touch, uh, a little not not necessarily lighter touch, but just less subtle about uh, giving out information. I think it's just my philosophy, and I, I, I I'm sure some people will disagree with me, but my philosophy is uh, if you have info. Uh, flavorful information that you want the PCs to learn don't leave it to chance just find a way to just give them the information and they will thank you for it yeah no I I, I definitely I definitely agree uh, especially because you'll have that information there it's like right there right there and then they don't get it <laughs> right um, <laughs> so um, as far as like the, the next question goes um so, one of my players, Trover, wants to know, uh, what's a good number of minions to give a big bad evil guy? And to kind of go along with that, like, how do you handle those minions? So, my th- my thinking with that is they need the minions need to have a chance to impact the battle in some way. Mm-hmm. Uh, you can't just... if if you've got this like super strong like the the players are 18th level and they're fighting this world ending monster uh but i gave them a bunch of goblins as 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 mooks uh those goblins aren't going to do anything like they're they can't roll high enough to attack the players uh the players can literally just ignore them uh, obviously that's a, a very extreme uh example but uh, there's there's kind of a line that I found where, you know, you, you don't want these, you don't want these uh, minions to be genuine threats in their own right, most of the time at least, um, you, like but you don't want them to be flat out ignorable. So I tend to like again. So I I primarily use Pathfinder First Edition. So uh, mm-hmm. if if these numbers don't mean anything to you, then I, I apologize. But if you have a if you have a, if your big bad evil guy is challenge rating of ten, uh, because you have a party of eighth level adventurers, uh, you would want his, uh, you would want to his minions to probably be around challenge rating of six or seven, uh, and you, I probably wouldn't put more than four of them in there. Um, on the other hand. Uh, Pathfinder actually has this very uh, fun 
uh, kind of template of bad guy called a troop that I've grown very fond of, which is essentially a, a swarm, like a like a army ant swarm or a bee swarm, which is basically again for Pathfinder mechanics, it's just this uh, like ten foot area of tiny creatures that just envelop uh, the the player characters and they just automatically deal damage because there's just so many of them. It's just a swarm of mosquitoes. There's so many mosquitoes biting you, you literally can't avoid them and they deal swarm damage to you. Um, so a troop is a lot like that, but it is a big cluster of mooks. There's dozens and dozens of goblins. There's so many goblins in that one area that you can't avoid all of them. You have impressive armor, you have quick reflexes, but there's too many goblins. Some goblins will hit you. You take 2d6 damage. Uh, and, you know, they, they can just envelop you in their space or, uh, you know, whatnot. And they also have, like, range attacks where, like, every single goblin takes out a sling and they all, f like, sling a stone at you. You block a bunch of them, but there's too many stones. You get hit by the stones, make a reflex save. It's basically a breath weapon. Um, so that's a very, uh, a very fun uh, kind of group of mooks I like to put into encounters where there's like a single big enemy and I feel like he just needs a little something. Yeah. Um, that's always a great fail safe because it's never an ignorable enemy. Because he can, they can just automatically deal damage. But it also is usually of a weaker kind of enemy, so it's still pretty easy to deal with. Yeah, no, I, I definitely agree. Um, and uh, honestly, something I never, never thought about is how you know with the, with the mosquitoes and the swarm type stuff. Um, and it makes a lot of sense. Uh, like, but like for like me, like especially when it comes time to like villains with like uh, legendary actions and for D and D five E um, and like those recharge abilities and stuff like that. Uh, this is gonna tip my hand a little bit. Um, I like to stack in a number of uh, minions to where I can get a full recharge on that bef by the time that they're all dead, so that he can <laughs> fire his legendary action or recharge ability twice before being dealt with himself. Yep, yep. Um, and it just because it makes sense for that kind of like methodical type villain and even the chaotic ones that they understand their capabilities. They understand how their own mechanics work. So, you know, that dragon with a fire with a huge fire breath weapon that recharges every five to six rounds is going to have some minions that'll last five to six rounds. Yep. <laughs> and that's all about um the dwindling the the player's resources their actions are resources too uh and time is in the case of that dragon whose breath weapon recharges uh time is his resource so yeah just knowing knowing what balance to have of you know and, and that's that's a fair point too because uh for pathfinder uh there's really not like a legendary action kind of mechanic like there are dragons that have breath weapons that recharge but um, you just never seem to fight enough dragons uh, in Pathfinder. Um, but yeah, having having that big recharge attack, uh, just having a bunch of mooks that aren't really going to do a lot of damage, that still functions as a really handy misdirect uh, for the the villain to employ. And he, he knows he's doing it. It's not just a matter of Oh, the GM's just metagaming. He's just throwing more mooks at us so his bad guy can recharge his big attack. Like, this villain's probably smart enough to know, you know, when these, when if I get overwhelmed, I want to make sure I have enough muscle in this room to just meat shield uh, me long enough yep. where I can at least get another hit off. Yep, yep. I, my, my, I'm getting angry messages from my players right now, calling me rude. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, when it comes time uh, for that, for like that, that that showdown and with with the minions, you've got the minions, you got the big bad, you got them all all there, right? Do you still incorporate your villains' uh, 
dialogue or um, actions that are not exactly combat centric. So, um, you know that 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 that's still keeping in line with the plot. You know, uh, villain that's been taunting the paladin the whole the whole adventure is going to use one turn to, if he has the upper hand, is going to use one turn to try to discourage that paladin even further. Or stuff like that. Like, mm. is that something that you incorporate still in your combat, or, or with you, is it more like when it gets down, gets down to that time for combat, is it just down to the nitty gritty? Let's roll and figure out who's coming out of this. Yeah. Um. I know. I I don't employ dialogue as often as I'd like to. A lot of the times. Um. I've even found myself. Uh, kind of preparing myself for you know oh this guy's got a lot that he wants to say to the the players when they start fighting like this person uh likes to taunt he's uh he's he's kind of rude uh he's gonna have a lot of cool things to say and then the combat ends and he's dead and i kind of turn around and i say i he didn't say a goddamn word that entire combat um so that's definitely something that I've kicked myself for for not doing, uh, but I definitely try to make a point to do it. And there's certainly uh, been many uh, memorable combats where the villain has has said a you know one line or another at a, a key moment that really just packed that extra oomph into uh, just making the the heroes just really go. You know you. Uh, you know why I oughta uh, just really uh, ramp up the the hatred for this guy. Uh, yeah. As far as just wasting an entire round taunting, that's not really something I've ever. Uh, I don't know if I've had if I've ran many encounters where I've had the luxury of doing that. Uh, I feel like for the most part, yeah, it's just we're here to fight. We got to fight. And if I don't spend every single round, every single action uh, fighting the players, uh, you know, they're, they're going to they're just going to steamroll this. And yeah, uh, even then, a lot of times they they do. And that's fine. But I've never, for the most part, found that it would have enhanced the combat if I spent an entire round just uh just having that dialogue a lot of times i'll i'll still have like a lengthy dialogue but for the most part i usually consider any dialogue from any character like just a free action it's not something that takes away from you know what you're doing in combat yeah yeah no i I definitely agree um so for our for our next question uh it's a little more uh into our personal experiences um what is your favorite big bad evil guy that you've created? And you kind of tell us a little bit about them. Hmm. <clears throat> I think one of my most beloved big bad evil guys um, was, and I, I'm I got to stretch my memory a little bit because uh, for. Anything I've run the last several years has been uh, uh, like pre-written campaigns from Paizo, so I don't want to take credit of uh, creating those those villains. Um, so I think I had to go back for then when I did everything uh, myself. Um, I made a villain named Reese Walker. Uh, and he was uh, a businessman and he just he did what businessmen do and he found uh, fruitful opportunities and took advantage of them and he originally wasn't going to be a big bad evil guy he was going to kind of be like a little speed bump he kind of hired a mercenary to off somebody that 
the adventures like kind of sort of new and just started this like mystery plot um and the the players they they killed a guy that I was not expecting them to kill who was being he was being shady and he was in a sense a villain but it was just supposed to be a tense situation but they kind of jumped the gun got a little little too aggressive a little too fast turned into a combat and I was like that's okay this guy can handle himself um but he couldn't and they ended up taking him out um and this guy worked directly for Reese Walker and so when Reese Walker found out uh he decided I need to replace my my man and he targeted one of the more naive members of the party uh, and hired him on as his new employee and things just kind of started building from there until eventually uh, he turned into um, he wasn't like it, it was a lot like what what you said earlier he just kind of turned into uh, the lieutenant of who would be the the big bad evil guy of the entire campaign uh, but he was a long-standing and uh, very uh, overt um, opposition of the party. And for, for a good while, he wasn't really seen as the big bad evil guy. He was just uh, this outstanding member of the community who chafed against their uh, actions. And so they didn't like him, but they didn't have a reason to just kick his door down and kill him. Uh, but yeah. once things, once the plot kind of got kicked into overdrive and they realized what was really going on, it made it, uh, it made it really sweet, really juicy, uh, for them to be like, oh, oh, we can go, okay, let's go kill Reese Walker. Uh, and so that, that turned into a really, uh, fun and like, yeah, I didn't really even like plan it. It just kind of, the story just kind of evolved and it all started with the PCs killing an NPC that, I wasn't expecting them to fight, and I wasn't expecting them to beat. And uh, I think that's another reason why he was one of my favorite uh, Big Bad Evil guys, because it was just against all expectations, and uh, it just, yeah, it just turned into a very uh, memorable uh, memorable uh, villain. If only the PCs knew how often they create more uh, more problems for themselves with their murder hobo ways. <laughs> that's too true um so kind of getting into into in towards the the last part of it um with my favorite uh big bad evil guy um i have this villain uh his name is is drach he is a kobold um he's a little dragon person for those of you who do not know um and he is a gunslinger um and he followed a, 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 a demon who was the enemy of the undead and hated all undead of all kinds and wanted them purged from the earth. Generally thought of by most as a one of the few good aligned demons because undead are bad, right? Um, but Is took everything to the extreme. Um, so anyone that was undead, anyone that was brought back by a resurrection spell. Anyone that used magic to stop themselves from dying or stop others from dying. Anything like that at all. He viewed them all the same. Undead. They should be dead. Therefore, they're undead. And so he took it upon himself to wipe them all out. And so he would go out and he'd find a new one and he'd start killing them. And he became this villain for the party um, because one of the, one of the party members is a fledgling young vampire hunter and um, is in a relationship with a, a Dompier who is a half vampire. Mm -hmm. And he, he just could not comprehend this whole thing at all. He just did not, did not compute. You hunt vampires, yet you're, you're dating one. He d doesn't make sense. And so that whole kind of conflict and how similar that these two characters were while also being polar opposites created this really compelling villain and you know you know different lines like uh if, if you're not going to end things with your girl i'll end them for you things like that uh, 
and it creates this compelling villain that you're seeing that they do a lot of the same things that you do. However, they don't have that line. They don't have that. They don't have that. Um, that line that you view as the line between good and evil. Yeah. And personally, is it, one of my favorite for that is because the majority of the population may view East as good because of what he does, because of how he how he's viewed. But that doesn't mean that he's still not a villain. Yeah, I think um, I think that could be one of the uh, like one of the highest tier uh, qualities that you can ever uh, give a villain uh, a big bad evil guy uh, is that the heroes uh, see themselves in the villain Um, I think that's uh, whether you know not just for uh, tabletop role playing games but for just about any story I think if you can create a villain who uh, you know a good a good example that comes to mind. I can't think of his name, um, but if uh, if you're familiar with the uh, How to Train Your Dragon movies, yes, the the third movie, um, mm-hmm. the 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 villain that he faces is um, he he also took down a Night Fury, which is the kind mm-hmm. of dragon that the main character befriends in the first movie. After shooting him down, injuring him, and they kind of learn to. Uh, adapt and you know need one another this guy had the exact same backstory uh but where hiccup uh hesitated and wound up befriending uh his dragon this guy did not and he killed the night fury and so you see all of the intelligence and ingenuity that you learn to love with the protagonist but at that pivotal moment in his story he did the exact opposite. He made he made one decision differently and wound up this villain. And he is he's a just a very interesting dynamic when those two face off as they do multiple times in that movie. Uh, so if you can create a villain that has that quality in your game, uh, you, you've won. Oh yeah, no, I, I agree. I agree, and then that's that's like that's like the pinnacle right there. Is especially like when, when <laughs> you know, it's like it's like that good thing when when like you're just hanging out with the party on like a non D and D session, and they're you know they're just they're just talking about how much they just they just can't wait to fight this big bad, and that they're they're just looking forward to it, and then it just it, it's that sense of accomplishment, like you know, like this this is a, this 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 is it. This is exactly what I was hoping for. I, I can't help but notice that uh, you're getting some very passionate uh, commentary from your uh, players in the chat right now. So I think um, I think you're there. I think you've uh, you've accomplished this. Uh, yeah. So uh, congratulations and well done. I appreciate it. <laughs> so when we're uh, now that we're wrapping up, um, aren't you uh, tell us a little bit about a uh, little bit about what Inspired Incompetence is getting up to? Kind of what the future is for what you guys are planning on over there yeah oh i was dreading this part um not a whole lot uh we have uh we've been kind of riding the course of what we've been doing and that's not really any we're not really about to change anything up too much so we have our main campaign tyrant's grasp uh, we also have a Patreon exclusive campaign uh, ran by another uh, player in that campaign. He runs the Patreon uh, campaign. It's called War for the Crown, and it's a, a more uh, political intrigue themed uh, campaign, also for Pathfinder First Edition. Um, so we we are currently running our annual art contest. Uh, where fans can, uh, whether you know they want to create a picture or uh, make like a little mini sculpture, or they can write a song or a short story, like any medium of art that uh, that they want to, and as long as it's inspired by the show, submit it, uh, and we uh, we pick a winner and we give them uh, some 
some free loot as a as a reward. Um, but we we don't really have any uh, big new projects in the works. Um, not to say that 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 won't change uh, any time down the pipe, but uh, yeah, we just have those two those two campaigns and uh, currently the art contest. Uh, and that's that's what we have uh, that's what we have right now on the on the docket. Nice, nice. I mean, I, I mean, I'm definitely loving what you're doing over Inspired Incompetence. Uh, um, well, thank you very much. Yeah. And then over at uh, Flavored Enemy, uh, <laughs> we've got uh, Tales of Atore uh, currently released their fifth episode, um, and that is uh, the current ongoing main campaign. Uh, we have Flavored Enemy Legacies, which is a collection of one-shots that all take place within the same world as Tales of Vittori, which is the world of Vittori, all across the timeline, different points in time, different locations. And I have guest DMs come in and actually be able to DM those one-shots and rotating players and such, different exams like with different play styles and such like that. Really fun little concept. That's a Patreon exclusive um, for listening. And then our next one's coming up is uh, Scourge of Stars, which is a uh, Fantasy Flight Games uh, Star Wars system, um, which is going to be an all-original story. Um, uh, takes place uh, during the beginning of the Rebellion. Um, so lots of different things going on there. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm, uh, it's, been a bit, it's been a busy one. <laughs> Yeah, I'm. I am certainly envious of of the amount of projects you guys have going on, um, at Flavored Enemy. Uh, that's that's great that you've got they've got so many projects going. I'm I'm a little jealous actually. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's been great talking to you, Alex. Uh, thanks for stopping by, and uh, we'll be looking to look forward to hearing more from Inspiring Competence. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me on the show. This was this was great. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, good luck with, with all of your projects and, uh, I, I wish you a uh, happy rolling. Thank you. You have a good one. You as well. <laughs>